As we gather here to hear God's word, let's pray silently. Pray for yourself that God would touch your heart and teach you what he wants you to learn today. Pray for those around you that they would hear the word of God and accept it. Please pray for me that I will be faithful to God's word. Dear Lord, may the words of the mouth, my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. I have never had to cook for 5,000, but there are two ways in which I can relate to this story of feeding multitudes. As the food services administrator for Hospitality Common, I regularly make up to 85 three-course meals in one night for our ESL students and their families. Sticking to a limited budget and feeling like I am making something out of nothing, or finding out on my way to cook that the key ingredient is out of stock at the grocery store, or showing up to work with full grocery bags of meat for my entree, only to find that the gas is off and the ovens are out of commission, learning to pivot in all of those situations has sometimes left me feeling like I do work miracles. Praise God for his gifts and provisions. I have heard it preached that what really happened in the loaves and fishes stories was not mystical, that each person actually did have a little bit of food with them, you know, like when we expect to be out all day and might pack a couple of granola bars just in case, that the miracle occurred when everyone became open enough to pool their resources and share. That is a beautiful interpretation, and there is much to be said about having an open heart and an abundance mentality. But I prefer to believe in the actual miracle of multiplication in God's economy, and the fact that this story is the only one in all four gospel accounts leads me to think that this was not just about the success of some spontaneous potluck. There is no doubt in my mind that these gospel lessons point to Christ's divinity, Jesus as the incarnate God and bread of life. However, in preparing for this message, I discovered a second way in which I relate to the lesson, to Jesus' humanity. My work hours vary, but there are days I have cooked for 10 hours straight and found myself almost unable to make the nighttime drive from Framingham home to Stowe. Sometimes I have forgotten or been unable to eat supper. I arrive home aching all over, and all I want is to sit in my big comfy chair and do something that does not require my brain. Imagine if 85 people followed me back to the house. <laughs> Would I be able to dig down deep enough emotionally and physically to say, sure, make yourself at home and I'll cook us all breakfast in the morning? Not in my own strength. We can all relate at times to Jesus being overtired. Jesus was so busy helping people, he too did not have time to eat. He tells his disciples to find a secluded place so they can get refreshed. Jesus goes off on his own for a bit of restorative solitude. But before long, the disciples and Jesus are all surrounded by the crowds again. Maybe supper had not even happened yet. Tradition tells us that the Holy Family was poor. I wonder if food was ever scarce, maybe as refugees in Egypt? We also know Jesus fasted. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Bread is still part of that equation, and I wonder if at any point Jesus longed for a nice warm loaf hot out of the oven. We can relate to the times our Lord may have felt hunger. In each of the four versions of this lesson, just before the feeding of the 5,000, the death of John the Baptist has recently occurred. Jesus has not only been working hard and missing meals, he has been dealing with the exhaustion of grief. At some point in his life, Jesus has already lost Joseph, the man who raised him. Now Jesus' cousin, murdered, a man only six months older whom he has known his whole life. When his good friend Lazarus dies in a future chapter, Jesus will publicly weep. We know how hard it can be some days to keep on going in the face of loss. We can relate to his grief. Each version of this story begins with Jesus going off by himself. He knows the importance of taking time to regroup, to recharge, and most importantly, to be in relationship with God the Father. Yet, in each version of the story, 
Jesus is interrupted. Someone requires his attention again. Because of his love and commitment to the people, he is there for them. He finds the strength. He also seizes opportunities, not just to meet needs, but also to teach and to train others. When the demands keep coming, Jesus delegates the tasks. Everyone is tired and hungry in this passage, and Jesus does not try to meet the needs all by himself. Yes, he miraculously multiplies the bread and fish. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. But he has the disciples do the organizing and passing out of the meal. This not only helps Jesus, it empowers and teaches the 12. In fact, it reaches and blesses more people. We can relate to round-the-clock caretaking of family members. We can relate to knowing that sometimes we need to ask for help. Have you ever found yourself frustrated with children or students or someone you are mentoring? You have shown and explained things so many times and they just don't get it. And it is painful to watch because you know they are really so capable if they would only practice and believe in the possibilities. Earlier, in today's chapter, Mark relates that the disciples have been sent out two by two to proclaim the good news and bear witness to it. Walter Brueggemann points out that they have been healing the sick and casting out demons in Mark 6.13, yet here on the hillside, as soon as the subject of bread comes up, they understand nothing. They are unable to believe in the life-giving, future-creating resources present in the person of Jesus. We can relate to Jesus feeling exasperated with his followers, or even angry. Before this gospel is through, Jesus will have confronted the legal experts in the temple, religious leaders who should have better priorities. We can relate to feeling angry with powerful officials. Here in the land of town meeting, we might be tempted to do something public about their lack of care for the community. Jesus was tempted to go public with his power early in his ministry. We can relate to deliberating over our options, wondering how next to proceed and will my decision really matter? Although it is not specifically mentioned in this reading, I believe that despite his exhaustion and hunger, Jesus experienced joy on this day. The incredulous look on the faces of his disciples must have been hilarious. <laughs> Witnessing the delight of 5,000 men, plus women and children, as they all sat down and ate en masse, miracles happen when people gather around the table and break bread together. And of course, Jesus celebrated holidays, weddings, reunions with friends, road trips, singing, and other very human experiences. We can relate to Jesus during the sweet and delightful times in our lives. Most of us are coming to understand the importance of self-care. We might join a gym, go out into nature, listen to music, spend time with friends, or for those of us who are introverts, become stronger through solitude. Jesus didn't just spend time with his disciples and those in need. He spent time in supportive relationships. The friends who had known him for years, such as Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. People with whom he could just be himself and let down his hair. His mother was present during his ministry, probably continuing to take care of her son as only a mother can. He knew enough to engage in these relationships and to humbly accept their support, but mostly, Jesus recharged by spending time alone with God. We know some of Jesus' prayers. We can see how much he loved his people and prayed for guidance, for their well-being, their understanding, and for continued growth in their faith. We know that Christ also prayed some very desperate, agonizing prayers. There was nothing he could not bring to the Father. Thirst, doubt and confusion, dread, even wanting certain situations to just disappear. We have experienced that. At the end of the loaves and fishes story, Christ does in fact go pick up where he left off with God the Creator. Jesus dismisses everyone and goes up to a mountain to pray for several hours. In three of the Gospel accounts, the disciples seem to have already forgotten the food miracle and they are out on a stormy lake, terrified. Jesus, on the other hand, has been refreshed and recharged in his time with the Father. In fact, Jesus is so restored that he walks on water. 
In the fourth gospel account, Luke describes Jesus' post-picnic time slightly differently. Christ experiences transfiguration. Regardless of what actually happened when, it occurred after Jesus spent time with his maker. He became revived, strengthened, filled with purpose, and empowered, visibly empowered in each of the gospel accounts to everyone in sight of him. Quiet time in God's presence changes things. It changes us. It changes the energy we radiate outward. It transforms our humanity. When Jesus came here to earth, why couldn't he just snap his fingers to provide for everyone's needs all at once, feed the hungry, fix our violent and selfish ways? I believe it is because God showed his love for humanity best by choosing to walk alongside it. Jesus knew exhaustion, grief, hunger, thirst, anger, pain, despair, spiritual and physical healing, and joy. He, the divine one, immersed himself, entered into our human experience. There is nothing we cannot bring before him. There is nothing he cannot understand. He relates to those with whom he is in relationship. His Holy Spirit is right here beside us. Take comfort and walk forth. Amen. <laughs>